everybody, Nick here at Modulus Props. Welcome down to my shop where today I'm sculpting a fox mask using monster clay. I'll be sculpting over a head armature. This is the original Ed head made by Monster Makers, the same company that produces monster clay. It's made of rigid foam and I've mounted mine to a wooden base for extra stability and I've also coated it with a brushable epoxy to give it a hard outer shell which just increases the durability a little bit and prevents me from gouging it with my tools. I've also sculpted on this kind of styrofoam mannequin head before, and these are great because they're cheap. Just be aware that they do tend to be smaller than an average size adult head. You'll notice throughout this video that I always have a bunch of reference photos to look at, and if you're relatively new to sculpting like I am, references are incredibly useful. Luckily, photo references are super easy to find these days on any subject you can think of, so I just did a quick image search and saved a handful of Fox photos that I liked, making sure I had views from different angles. I mentioned the clay I'm using is monster clay, and this is the medium grade in particular. You can heat it with a light bulb in a box to soften it, and one of the things I love most about it is that it is not sticky. It doesn't stick to your hands or your tools. I think it's a great clay for beginners, and I recommend it often, but there are tons of great clays out there, and everyone finds their favorites. I personally tend to stick with oil-based clays like monster clay because they don't dry out like water clays do, so I can put a half-finished sculpture on the shelf, come back to it months later, and I don't have to worry about it drying or cracking. What I'm doing here is building up a base surface on my armature. I don't always do this, and it depends on how I want the mask to fit, but in this case, I don't want the mask to be too form-fitting, and I want to make sure I leave room for padding and to allow for different head shapes and sizes. So this first layer of clay is mostly just a reminder to me to keep some space between the actual mask and the armature. At this point, I'll break out one of my first tools. This is a rake made by Valdez Tools and it has a serrated blade on each end. You'll notice up until this point, I've only been using my hands to manipulate the clay. While it's warm, you can move it around and smooth it using just your fingers, but as it cools to room temperature, it actually firms up quite a bit. This rake tool does two things for me. It evens out the surface and it gives the clay a rough texture so that my next layer of clay has something to stick to. Once I've got this base layer evened out and symmetrical, I can start putting down clay that will form the actual shape of my mask. So with my reference photos in view, I'll start building up the rough form. I know I want this to be a masquerade style mask that ends at the mouth, so I'm starting here at the bottom of the mask, building up the snout shape and the fluffy bits of fur out toward the cheeks. I'm placing relatively large bits of clay, not worrying yet about smoothing or any detail, just going for the major shapes and planes that I think are needed to convey the look of a fox. When I say planes here, I don't mean literal flat surfaces, but if you're sculpting something complex like an animal head or a human face, these things have a lot of complex geometry, so being able to reduce that geometry in your mind to an arrangement of more basic shapes gives you a good starting point for roughing out a sculpture. As I work, I keep a big chunk of clay in my hand, and when that starts to cool, I'll swap it out for a new chunk from my clay warmer. Something I'm trying to pay attention to here during the rough out stage is symmetry. It can be tricky to sculpt something that's perfectly symmetrical, but that's fine because nature rarely produces things that are perfectly symmetrical. And in fact, a bit of asymmetry can actually make a sculpture more interesting. I'd like to end up with something that's for the most part symmetrical, and I'll show some techniques for that later on, but right now I'm just using my eye. Now that I have a very basic structure in place, I'll bring back my rake tool and take down the surface just a bit. This helps me to see the overall form because it's unifying all those separate little blobs of clay into a more continuous surface. You'll see I end up alternating between additive steps where I'm building up areas or filling in low spots and subtractive steps where I'm raking the surface back down. It may seem counterintuitive, but this is a technique that I find works really well for sculpting geometric shapes with smooth surfaces and distinct corners. My mask isn't going to end up totally smooth, but I have a plan for adding in some fur detail later. When I first started sculpting, I wasn't using rakes that often because I didn't really know how to use them. I would try building up shapes like this and then using my fingers to try to do all the smoothing, but rakes are so much more efficient for this, especially with a firmer clay like monster clay. 
A rake like this does remove some material, but I can compensate for that by slightly overbuilding the areas I know I'll be raking down later. And this is a relatively large and coarse rake. I'll use it early in the sculpting process, but later I'll switch to smaller rakes when I need to focus on finer details. Here I'm refining the shape of the snout and I'll add a basic little fox nose shape, which I won't fully detail now. I'll come back and finish this later. I've noticed a spot on this side of the mask that's not quite matching the other side, so I'll build it up in the areas where it needs it, then rake it down to smooth it. Love that rake, but now it's time to bring out the next tool I want. This is probably one of the most common tools I see other sculptors use, and I use it quite a bit. It's the W21 made by Kemper Tools. It has a wire loop on one end and a rounded wood handle, and it's actually the handle side that I use most often. I'm using it to shape the inside of the eyes here, and that handle is just a great shape for a bunch of different uses, including getting to tough to reach inside corners like I'm doing here. Something I find really important to do throughout the sculpting process is to look at my sculpture from as many angles as possible, including, in this case, from the bottom. Now, this isn't always possible depending on your armature, but I can lay down this armature easily enough, and this actually has allowed me to notice that the snout on my mask is a bit off-center. Now, of course, that's easy enough to fix. I've chosen just to bulk it out in one direction to recenter it. While I've got my rake in hand, I'm hollowing out these ear shapes. This is another spot where I'll be adding some detail later. I've mentioned symmetry a few times, and this is a tool I often use to help with that, just a basic set of adjustable calipers, and I typically use it to take measurements from the center line out to the edges, but for this sculpture I didn't actually use it all that much. One thing I did do often is to step back from the sculpture to view it from a distance away. This eliminates the perspective distortion you can get when you're right up on a piece, and it can actually look very different when you step back. Another trick that's handy when you're trying to see symmetry is to look at it upside down. After staring at something for so long, your brain just starts ignoring certain details like the symmetry, so flipping it can give you a fresh perspective. By laying my armature down on my bench, I can take a look at it from the top, and this also makes it a little more comfortable for me to work on certain areas, for example, the nose. Now that I'm confident I don't need to make any major changes in this area, I can go back and add in the details that are missing. I'm using the wire loop end of my Kemper tool to dig out the nostrils here and the handle end I'll use for smoothing, at least in the areas I can reach with that tool. To shape and smooth really tight spaces like inside these nostrils here, I need to switch out to something smaller. I like to use a ball stylus tool for this type of thing. I have several sizes and you can see they get pretty tiny. A steady hand is also good to have, and you can see I'm resting my finger here on the sculpture to help stabilize my hand. As I start to fine tune some of the other surfaces, I'm still going through the same cycle of adding clay and raking it to smooth it, just with smaller and smaller bits of clay. The rake is the same, I've only used one rake so far, but I am starting to use a lighter touch with it, so it's not removing as much clay as it was before. Even with a light touch, this will leave behind rake marks, and I could switch to a finer rake here if I wanted to smooth this out even more, but with the fur texture that I'm planning to add next, it's not necessary. So here is where I've ended up with the shape of this mask. You can see the geometric styling I was talking about earlier, and notice how the shadows fall on these shapes. Now I can get into some fur texturing, and I'll be using a ribbon tool for much of it. These are basically loop tools that have flat metal ribbons instead of round wires, and I use them mostly for carving. They're not sharp enough to cut into hard materials like wood or anything, but they do carve into monster clay really well. There are a million ways to sculpt fur, and this method is entirely subtractive and probably one of the easier methods. I'm just carving out chunks of clay using wavy lines in a random pattern. 
It won't end up giving the most realistic looking fur, but I'm using these triangle shaped trenches to my advantage because I think they add to the geometric feel of the mask. I'm starting with the deepest trenches out at the edges of the mask, and as I work my way in toward the center, I'll use a lighter touch with my lines spaced closer together. I'll let them overlap each other to help break up the pattern and fill it in. Once I turn my armature back upright, you can see how neat this looks with the overhead lighting. I'm realizing there's a detail I'd like to add to the eyes, so before I get too far with my fur texture, I'll go back and add that. I'm rolling out some thin little clay snakes using the surface of my workbench, and I'm adding these in as some lower eyelids. Not really an anatomically correct eyelid, more of a suggestion, but I think this detail will help to break up the center section of the mask and highlight the eyes. Notice the tool I'm using again here, that same Kemper W21, which honestly, if I were only allowed to have one sculpting tool, it would probably be that guy. This time I'm using the edge of the handle to blend in the edge of this eyelid. And then I'm using the round side of the handle to smooth it out. Now I'll go back to adding in my fur texture using that ribbon tool starting up at the ears. Foxes always have big tufts of fur in their ears and to get that look I'm just using the same technique I was earlier, starting with the bigger carved trenches, and transitioning to the smaller ones, trying to be somewhat organic and random with it. So now at this point I have all of the course for detail that I wanted to add. These are details that are still big enough to see from a little bit of a distance. Using that same ribbon tool, I'll continue working the texture toward the middle of the mask. The ribbon tool is still removing some material, but only a tiny bit. You can see it's actually leaving these little bits of clay on the surface, and I'm not worrying too much about that right now. If I tried to brush them away with my hand, I can just end up smushing them back into the surface, which is not what I want. There are a few different ways to remove them, including blowing them off with compressed air, but I'll end up using a brush once I'm all done with the texturing. Adding this kind of small, monotonous detail might seem really tedious and boring, especially when you need to add a lot of it, but it's actually kind of a zen thing for me, and for a lot of sculptors. The sculpture is mostly done, there are no big decisions left to make, so you can just relax into a groove and add the last little bit of detail, which often is what really brings a sculpture to life. The last section I need to texture is the snout, and I'm switching back to my Kimper tool because now I just want to press in very light grooves without actually removing any material. On the snout towards the tip of the nose is where the fur on a fox gets really short and fine, so I'm recreating that by using a really light texture. I will also mention that I am still paying attention to my photo references, trying to match up the directionality of the fur around the snout. The very last step is to remove all those little bits of clay stuck to the surface from the texturing. I'm using just a plain old chip brush for this and I've trimmed the bristles a bit shorter because I don't want it too soft at the end. Besides removing the extra clay bits, the brush is also knocking down all the edges just a little bit, bringing everything together into one cohesive surface. This is often the last smoothing step I'll use for monster clay, 
There are other ways to smooth, including heat guns and different types of solvents, but a brush works best when I don't want to lose a lot of detail. And with that, my Fox Mask sculpture is complete and ready to mold.